Years back, Stephen Colbert made a comment about Buddhism. He said, you wrap yourself up in a cloth, you go sit under a tree, and you breathe. That's what we're doing. We're not under a tree right now, but we are sitting here breathing, focusing on the breath. Realizing that the breath has a huge role in contributing to our well-being. Of course, if we didn't breathe, we'd be dead. But more than that, the way you breathe can have an effect on the health of the body and the health of the mind. So pay careful attention to how you're breathing. Take a couple of good long, deep in and out breaths. And notice where you feel the process of breathing in the body. That sense of energy flow, that's what we're actually focusing on when you focus on the breath. Not so much the air coming in out of the lungs, but the flow of energy in the body. And that exists on many levels. You start with the energy that allows the air to come in and go out. But as you get more and more sensitive to how it feels just being here in your own body, fully inhabiting your own body, you begin to realize there are other subtle energies that go throughout the body, all the way down to the tips of the fingers, the tips of the toes. But you start with the ones that are most obvious. So wherever you feel the breathing, wherever it seems most prominent, focus your attention there. Try to stay there. both so that you can observe the breath carefully, and so you can begin to observe the mind carefully. And at the same time, give the mind a place to settle down. The mind needs this, because that's where the mind gains its sense of well-being and its ability to stay in one place for a while. It's like moving into a house. If you had to unpack your baggage and then pack it up again every day, move out of the house, then come back in again. There'd be no real ease in living in the house. But you move in, unpack your baggage, and stay. Then when you come back, everything is in its place. You can relax. The mind needs a place to stay like that for its basic well-being. Otherwise, it's going around looking for things outside all the time to compensate for the fact that its home is not a good place to be. So move back and make this house of the body a home by the way you breathe. You can try long breathing, short breathing, fast, slow, heavy, light. See what kind of breathing feels best for the body right now. I guess the breath is one of the functions of the body that can be both automatic and under your, under your control. So learn how to use that control to a good purpose. The mind has a sense of being well fed inside, because the mind has its food just like the body has its food. The mind has its wealth just as the body has its wealth. And of course, the, ultimately the food and the wealth of the body are much less important than the food and the wealth of the mind. So start feeding the mind well with a sense of well-being, but also with your intention to do something good. You're training the mind here to be more alert more mindful, to put its heart into doing something well. Mindful means to keep something in mind. It's not just simply noticing what's arising and passing away without reacting, or just accepting everything that comes. That's equanimity. That's something else. Mindfulness is remembering. The mind needs to be trained, You're remembering how, what you've learned about how to do it. So when something comes up in the mind, you learn how to recognize the quality of the mind is skillful or unskillful, helpful or unhelpful in training the mind. And then remembering what to do with the skillful qualities, what to do with the unskillful qualities. And for the time being, there's one simple lesson to remember, and that's stay with the breath. If the mind wanders off, just drop that thought and come right back. Wanders off again. Drop the thought and come back again. Don't get discouraged. Each time you come back, don't get hard on yourself by the fact that you wanted off. Actually reward yourself for the fact that you've come back by breathing in a way that feels really good. 
think of parts of the body that are not getting much nourishment from the breath, and think of the breath going there. And of course you can do one breath like that, and you can do two, and then three and four. See if you can find a way of breathing that feels really good for the parts of the body that are tired, that have been tense. And you find that this ability to stay with the body in the present, have a sense of well-being in the body, can be really nourishing. When the breath feels good, think of that comfortable sensation permeating throughout the body. Think of the whole body breathing, all the nerves in the body breathing all the blood vessels, all the muscles, all the parts, breathing together. And this way you create a good home right here. And then you can fill your home with wealth. Someone once came to see the Buddha and commented on a, a millionaire who lived in the town about what his treasures were. gold, silver, all kinds of things. And the Buddha said, yes, there is that kind of wealth, but there's another kind of wealth that nothing outside can touch. He called it noble wealth. And that's the wealth that's good for the mind. That's the wealth that really gives good food for the mind. And there's no criticism of people who amass this kind of wealth at all. With outside wealth, some people are greedy, some people cheat. But then what do they get? They get material things and then they have to let them go. With inside wealth, you don't gain it by cheating. It comes from the goodness you develop inside. And nothing can take it away. Fire can't burn it. Water can't wash it away. Thieves can't take it. And it's much better than outside wealth at finding, providing a sense of real well-being for the mind. There are seven qualities in all that count as inner wealth. The first is conviction. Technically, it's conviction in the Buddha's awakening, but what it means for us is the fact that human beings can, through their own efforts, find happiness. Their efforts really do make a difference. We do have an impact through our actions on the happiness or the lack of happiness we'll experience. That this thought is empowering, because it makes you trust in the fact that, yes, your actions do make a difference, and so you're more and more inclined to put an effort into doing them well. That's wealth right there. And then there are three other qualities that go together with that. There's a sense of shame, a sense of compunction, and virtue. And the shame here is not the unhealthy shame where you feel bad about yourself which is the opposite of pride. This is the shame that's the opposite of shamelessness. And so, in other words, you think of doing something unskillful and you'd be ashamed. You think it's beneath you, you realize it's beneath you. You think of how the people you respect would look at you if you did something like that. And that's a form of wealth because it can prevent you from doing all kinds of things that you're later going to regret. Years back, I heard a radio broadcast where an old veteran of the Vietnam War was talking about a young girl that he'd killed years back. And he said every day the picture of that girl's face comes into his mind. He can hardly sleep at night. He said if he had a million dollars, he'd go back and undo that part of his past. Well, even a million dollars can't un erase things you've done in the past. So if you have a proper sense of shame. And you put it together, a sense of compunction, in other words, the sense that if you realize that something is going to lead to unskillful results, you say, I don't want those results. This is the opposite of apathy. You care about the results of your actions. So shame together with care is worth more than a million dollars or any amount of money, because it prevents you from but working together, they prevent you from doing things you'll later regret. And they go together with virtue, promises you make to yourself that you're not going to harm others. 
the Buddha lists five virtues. Not killing, not stealing, not having illicit sex, not lying, not taking intoxicants. Of those five, not lying, he says, is the most important. Because a lie can do a lot more damage for a much longer time, even than killing. You kill somebody, and that's just the end of one life. But if you give them wrong information, sometimes that can affect them for many lifetimes. So you're very careful not to harm anyone. And then you can look at your own actions, realizing that you've caused no harm. That creates a huge sense of well-being in the mind. You lived in the world, and you haven't just been taking. You've actually been giving, which, I, which actually is another one of the, the seven qualities of inner wealth, the ability to give, the desire to give. Generosity is not simply a matter of giving when you have to. It's giving when you want to, where you feel inspired, where you feel that someone else would make good use of what you have. You have more than enough to share. This ability to see that you have more than enough to share, that's a form of wealth right there. So many people in the world have piles and piles of wealth, yet they don't have a sense of enough. And that attitude of the mind, that not enough, not enough, that's poverty in the mind. Whereas if you realize you're strong enough and you have a sense of well-being inside that's steady enough, that you can do perfectly without with all kinds of things, and so you're happy to share what you have, that creates a much more spacious mind. And in this way, it creates a sense of commonality. Because if you give something to somebody else, it, it actually erases a barrier between you and the other person. It's as if that other person was a member of your family. When you demand the payment for something, that creates a barrier. This is reflected in Thailand when the, the monks live in a, what we call an economy of gifts. We depend on the gifts of others. And the monks will often talk to their supporters as if they were members of the family. That's just, not just that the monks are on the taking side. When you regard your donors as members of the family, you, you can't help but feel sympathy for them. You want to make sure that you're not abusing their generosity. There are a lot of rules around this for the monks, but it's more than just rules. There's an attitude you should take. You're happy to receive other people's generosity. You appreciate the effort they put into it, so you don't want to abuse it, even if the generosity that you're receiving is not anything you particularly like. You realize it comes out of the goodness of someone's heart. So that places a burden on you. When I was in Thailand, I was on, a, on my alms round, there was one very poor family. Just a young couple. They'd just gotten married. They lived in a little shack that was just big enough for the two of them to lie down in, with a little kitchen out behind. But every, every day they would have food for my bowl. I'd go back to the monastery after re receiving their food and remind myself, I've been the recipient of a poor person's generosity. I've really got to practice hard today. So as I said, generosity creates a good society, a society in which people are simply thinking in terms of money and what they can get, that society breaks down. Because it's a society filled with walls that divide us from one another. Generosity is what erases those walls. It makes society a good place to live. You might say that generosity is the price we pay for the advantages of living in, with humanity in a humane way. The two remaining forms of wealth are learning, learning of the Dharma, in other words, figure out, learning what the Buddha had to say, the teachings that help us look for the causes of suffering inside and also look for the cessation of suffering inside, inside, through qualities we can develop inside. 
and then discernment and how to learn how to apply those teachings so that we get those benefits. When we have all these forms of wealth inside, that's when the mind is, is prosperous. And that's the kind of prosperity that really means something. The prosperity in the world comes and goes, goes up and down with the economy. And as I said, there's nothing particularly honorable about being wealthy in external terms. But there is honor in internal wealth, noble wealth. That sense of honor in and of itself is food for the mind, a sense of well-being that makes it easier for the mind to settle down. When you sit down here and meditate, you can reflect back on the day, you can reflect on the way your actions have influenced the people around you, affected the people around you. And it's easy to spread goodwill to everybody, because there's no one you've harmed. From that sense of goodwill, then you can focus on developing the qualities of the mind. Where you're going to try to find a happiness that doesn't harm anybody, yourself or anyone else. So these are the forms of wealth that you want to include in creating this sense of belonging right here, right now, feeling at home right here, right now. Because you've created a really spacious sense of belonging inside. 